We'll have a brief look at uh, stellar spectra now. And uh, let me first show you just a spectrum of Vega and the sun. Okay. We met uh, Vega while talking about uh, the calibration of uh, magnitudes. Vega was assigned zero magnitudes in the different filters. And of course, the sun you're all too familiar with. So Vega has a surface temperature of 9,600 Kelvin roughly. And the sun has a temperature, as you know, of close to about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. The overall spectrum is a black body, right? And superimposed on it are the absorption lines. And today we'll have a brief look at how stars are classified on the basis of their spectrum. And as I kept mentioning several times that stars are characterized by the absorption lines, which you see. There are stars which also emit em emission lines, exotic stars, but generally the stars are characterized by the absorption lines. And this figure on the left actually illustrates why this happens, that you have slightly cooler outer photosphere compared to the hot dense interior from which the photons are coming. And because this is cooler, it, it gives rise to absorption lines of the radiation coming from the hotter interior. Now, this is Vega and the sun. So can you just briefly tell me what are the differences you notice straight away? Any one of you can unmute and say. Well, we, we see that Vega is emitting a lot more at lower wavelengths. Uh, cool. By way lower wavelengths, I mean shorter wavelengths. So Very you can good. see that's because it's more blue. Very good. So that comes from the Williams displacement law because you have a higher temperature. So it is peaking at a smaller wavelength, right? Uh, that's excellent. Okay, no, one more, one more suggestion of anything else which you see is different? The amount of energy of the flux is higher. Um, is that because of the size of the star? Uh, flux size of the star is a more luminous star than our sun. And okay. that's good. That's good. That's pretty, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the other aspect I want you to notice is that uh, the, I've marked the Balmer lines over here. Okay. H alpha. 65, uh, 6.3 nanometers. H beta is 486 nanometers, which is here, okay? H gamma, 434 nanometers. H delta, 410 nanometers, right? So what you notice straight away is that the Balmer lines in hydrogen, Balmer lines in the sun are much weaker than in Vega, isn't it? And it, it was because of, uh, you know, initially it was thought that, uh, um, that uh, the constituents of the stars were similar to the earth. Um, and quite a number of leading astronomers believed that before the seminal work of uh, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, uh, well, you should read a you know, bit about her life as well, a remarkable woman who, you know, made her way to Harvard because of uh, gender discrimination in the UK. And over here, you know, her results, she was the first one to show that uh, that, that is not the case from a study of stellar spectra using both uh, Boltzmann's equation of, uh, of uh, electrons at different energy levels and Saha, which talks about the ionizations of species and showed that, uh, that uh, the sun actually consists of hydrogen and helium largely, and not and is not at all similar to that of the Earth. So we will try to get at least a qualitative understanding of why that is the case. Okay. So take home is that uh, uh, what uh, Akino mentioned and what Kriti also mentioned that one is the overall luminosity and the fact that it peaks more towards the blue end of the spectrum because Vega is hotter. The sun, as you can see, is in this region over here, uh, peaks at a longer wavelength compared to Vega because the surface temperature is lower, uh, but also the important aspect of the 
hydrogen lines being weaker. So just to highlight that, after highlighting that, let me just tell you a little bit of history. Uh, William Wollaston was the one, you would have heard about Wollaston Wallace, prism, prisms. Uh, notice that the spectrum of sunlight not continuous, but a dark band superimposed on it. Okay, and there seemed to be a natural boundary between colors. Uh, Joseph Fraunhofer found about 600 dark lines and measured the wavelengths of three, about 324 of these. There's a beautiful uh, German stamp honoring uh, Fraunhofer and his uh, absorption lines in the stellar spectrum. And William Huggins showed that the dark lines in the spectra of stars matched with of stars matched with those of terrestrial substances. Okay. In the meantime, of course, Kirchhoff and Bunsen, the Bunsen burner and Kirchhoff with his laws of uh, the, the, the thermodynamics, uh, you began to sort of see that, uh, you know, the interpretation of spectra uh, and uh, Huggins sort of uh, showed that the dark lines matched with the spectra you, you could get from terrestrial substances. Now the classification of stellar spectra, um, the current classification scheme that we'll talk about initially developed at Harvard Observatory. Uh, Henry Draper, uh, who was an, a very enthusiastic uh, amateur astronomer, started this work in the early part of the 20th century. And after his death, his wife donated equipment and money to the observatory to continue to work. And most of the early work was done by uh, Annie Jump Cannon during 1918 to 24. And here is where we had uh, the Henry Draper and the Henry Draper extension catalog of more than 200,000 stars down to about ninth magnitude. So these were really pioneering work of the time. And a lot of the time, a lot of the work was done by this uh, group of uh, women. And Henrietta Leavitt was part of it. Henrietta Leavitt we meet, met while trying, while understanding uh, variability of stars, specific variables for, which are uh, which have been one of the cornerstones of measuring distances in astronomy. And they were working under uh, the supervision of uh, this gentleman over here, uh, Mr. Pickering. Okay, now just to illustrate to you briefly, observing emission and absorption lines, that uh, what you see over here is a, you see a black body source, which could be a star, you're observing it. If you observe it directly over here, then you would see a uh, black body spectrum without any sort of intervening dust. If there was no clouds on the way to your observatory where you're observing. But often there is gas and dust in it. So this is the absorption feature which you see due to absorption. In the case of the stars, the absorption occurs in the photosphere, the outer cooler layers over here, absorbing light from the hot interiors. And if you look at a gas cloud which has been excited, uh, not against the background of the source, then you will see the emission lines through them. So a cloud of gas, for example, the Orion Nebula, which exists near the massive star, lines get excited by the star, and then you see emission lines, right? For example, if you took a, took a prism, which is what uh, William Herschel did and extend and tried to measure temperature beyond the red end, then you, it'll break up into the colors, right? But if you had an absorption, absorbing cloud, and you broke it up, then you would get the absorption lines as well. Now, uh, just, to, just a few more sort of uh, ideas to tell you about uh, stellar spectra, that uh, the heavier elements are also present, although the bulk of the, hydrogen, bulk of the star consists of hydrogen and helium, um, a, a whole lot of trace elements are present. Here, I've shown you uh, iron, lithium, calcium, uh, which are present in the solar atmosphere. Uh, I over here in this figure, you can see Fe1, uh, Fe1, Fe1, Li1, lithium, then you can see calcium one. So just like H1 is neutral atomic hydrogen, one denotes that these are not ionized, these are neutral atoms. Cooler outer layers, they found a cooler outer layers, which are outer layer, which is not ionized. Uh, some years ago, there was also a report of water, right, in, in the in the sun, which is not which is not in a liquid form, but in a vaporized form, but in some cooler area near a sunspot, water water vapor was also detected. In the sun, about for every about twenty five thousand iron atoms, and there are about two thousand five hundred calcium atoms, 
for every one lithium atom. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight to you that uh, you can't straight away infer what uh, lines or how many atoms are there by just looking at the strength of the lines. Okay. For example, you can see that calcium in this part of the spectrum, okay, calcium is much stronger uh, than the iron and the lithium lines over here. Okay, there are many more, uh, many more lines of uh, many, many more atoms of calcium compared to lithium, but you can see there are many more atoms of iron compared to calcium. Yet calcium is much more, much more uh, prominent in the absorption line. Okay, so we will we will not do the maths, but we will try to get an intuitive understanding of the physical processes that determine why some lines are stronger than others. While comparing, sorry. So, so the colder outer layer of the star, you know, absorbs, um, absorbs a particular frequencies. But when when chemo when um, chemicals are heated, they also emit light at particular frequencies. So why aren't there peaks from those elements present in the core of the star? That, that would be that would be very weak, because you're dominated by the star from by the light from the background uh, star. Okay. Uh, it is similar to this over here, okay? Because your overall spectrum is dominated by the, the, the background star because that is the one which is extremely bright. But if you didn't have the background star, your, your photons which you're detecting is not dominated by the background star, you're looking at it from an angle, then you will go and see the emission lines. But in the case of the star, because your overall spectrum is dominated by the, by the, by the, by the star itself, so you don't you don't pick up the emission lines which are emitted by the cooler outer layers over here. But for example, uh, in the sun or other stars as well, if you look at the corona, which is where you don't see the background star, you are going to see emission lines from the corona, right? You you'll, you'll see emission lines. I don't have a figure over here, but you will see emission lines from the corona. But here the here what you're seeing is effectively the spectrum of the star and anything which is emitting over here, which is sort of recombining, absorbing and re-radiating, that would be extremely weak compared to the background light from the star. Okay? Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but just Google up and look at the spectrum of the corona, solar corona, um, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see emission lines over there, all right? Okay. Now we'll try and get an intuitive understanding for why uh, the calcium lines are stronger than iron, although iron is much more prevalent. What are the what is the physical uh, processes which determine that? Okay. Now this is uh, um, I mentioned the classes of stars over here, but we will summarize that a little later. Okay, uh, but but over here the O type stars are the most luminous stars. They are the most massive, and as you go down this spectrum, you will begin to see. Uh, less massive and less luminous stars. A sun is a G-type star, okay? It's a G-type star, so it is somewhere over here, right? Now, Vega is an A-type star, so Vega is somewhere over here, okay? Now, if you take an O-type star over here, I'll just, look, I'll just point out some specific features, okay? Some specific features. Uh, what is marked over here are H-beta, H, H beta, H gamma, H delta, etc. Okay. Now you will see that in the in the brightest stars, it is there, but it is not as as dominant as an O type star. Right? Yeah. A type stars seem to have the most prominent absorption lines for the Bama lines. And when you, by the time you come to a G-type star like our sun, it is again not dominant at all. And when you come to the coolest stars, then you can see that you know the gaseous atmospheres or the absorbing medium is more in the molecular form. Here, absorption bands due to titanium oxide are marked over here. Okay. So absorption lines bound bound or bound free transitions. Bound free transitions, you're not going to specific. Uh, uh, well-defined line like H beta or H delta, but the electron would be from the 
uh, bound state to a completely free state of atoms, ions, and molecules in the outer layers of the star. Hydrogen bomber lines we mentioned. Uh, there are also lines of uh, uh, helium, sing singly. Uh, this is uh, neutral helium over here. You'd also get lines of uh, neutral and singly ionized helium. Um, iron lines, I'll mark more of them later, but it's not quite clearly shown over here. G band over here due to the CH molecule. Then there's a neutral calcium line over here at 422.7 nanometers and uh, several lines around 431 man nanometers or so and lines of titanium oxide, which I just mentioned. So as you go from the more massive stars to the least massive ones, most luminous ones to the less luminous ones or the least luminous ones, you can see that there is a distinct change in the spectra of the stars. So it is by looking at these spectra that, uh, that um, Howard took observatory classified stars. Okay, here actually I have uh, marked in the pre previous figure features which were not marked very well. Um, these are again the H beta line, H alpha line over here for an A type star. And again, you can see the in, in an O type star, uh, you, the helium lines are there, which are not quite visible in the A type star. Okay. Helium is visible here, not here. Uh, G type, you get the G band, uh, you get H alpha, H beta, but they're uh, much weaker compared to A type, uh, A type stars. You can see H beta, you can compare over here. Now, then you get a G band over here. And when you, these are again, this is going reverse in terms of uh, this, the class or the luminosity. And you can see for the M type stars, which are the least luminous ones, you can uh, load the lowest temperatures, you see the titanium oxide plus other molecules as well. Now we will try to get some kind of an understanding of that, okay. Now, uh, what is shown over here again, just to reinforce what we have been saying, that A, B, F, and G uh, is the zeros are further subclassifications. We will look at it briefly over here. So suppose I take uh, a B type star, right? Or an A type star, let's see what it is showing us. Uh, B type star is about 35,000 Kelvin, okay? B is over here, this is the first one. Okay, these are the most massive stars, the most luminous stars. Uh, each in high energy states, ionized, very few in low energy states. Okay, so what happens is that suppose you want to see a particular line, right? Then there are two things which you require. You require enough number of electrons in that particular energy level to be able to have a prominent line. Okay. For example, suppose uh, suppose I have a I, I do not have any electrons at the n equal to two level, or very few in number, right? Then I will not be able to get the transitions from n equal to two to three, or n equal to two to four, or n equal to two to five, etc. Isn't it? So physically, what it means is that one thing is that you need enough electrons at an energy level for, to be able to go from that energy level to a higher energy level to be able to absorb it. Right? And the distribution of electrons in the different energy levels of an atom or an ion is given by the Boltzmann's equation, e to the power of minus e upon kt. Okay? Now, the other aspect of it is also that the level of ionization and the degrees of ionization of the species, which is given by the Saha ionization equation. For example, if I, if the ionization level is very high, okay, then, then there obviously will not be enough electrons at that energy level, because if the, if the species is completely ionized, you're not going to see lines corresponding to that as well. So you need a clever balance between the degree of ionization and the electron population at the different energy levels to determine the strength of the absorption lines in stars. 
So when you look at a beast type star, that hydrogen is in high energy states. And the level of ionization and the energy levels would basically be governed by the temperature at the surface of the star, okay? So hydrogen is largely ionized, okay? Very few in low energy states. So in the case of hydrogen, you're not going to see strong lines in a star, which is called B-type, but it is the most luminous stars. These, these, these names actually came historically from the way Draper and the Harvard Observatory did things, and we have been following this. Now, when I go to a lower temperature star, 9,500 degrees Kelvin, which is like a Vega star, okay? At lower temperatures, you know, number of the proportion of atoms which are ionized will come down. And you want the maximum number of electrons to be in the first excited state, okay? And you want the photons coming out from the star at 9,500 degrees Kelvin to be able to take it from n equal to two or n equal to three or n equal to four, depending upon which one of the Bama lines that you're talking about. So for an A0 star, given the surface temperature of the star, it seems to be just right to have enough hydrogen atoms not, in the, not ionized and at the right energy levels to give you the strong lines, the Bama lines that you see. That is why the A-type stars, which are, as you can see, more luminous and have a higher surface temperature than the our sun, gives you very prominent lines of hydrogen. Let's go lower in temperature. When you go to lower in temperature, the number of atoms in the ground state keeps increasing. Right? The lower the temperature, at very low temperatures, everything will be in the ground state. Okay? So once the number of electrons in the first excited state go down, then the lines are going to get weaker because your Bauman lines are from n equal to two to higher values of n. And as you go lower in temperature, the number of you know, ionized species also go down. Okay. Let's go to even lower. Now we are approaching close to our sun. And this is G0 uh, that we'll come to in a short while. Let's say about 5,900 degrees Kelvin, the number of atoms in the ground state increases. So there are even fewer atoms in the first excited state to be able to give you the Bama lines, okay? So when you come to G0 over here, which is given by the light blue line, okay? Light blue line, you find that the Bama lines are very weak. They're seen, but very weak, right? So you can see that it was weaker. It was weak for the B-type stars because the energies were large. A lot of it was ionized, very few, in the low excited, low energy states, they would all be in the higher excited states or ionized. When you come to A type star, then the surface temperature drops from 35,000 to about 9,500 for an A zero star. And it seems to have enough hydrogen atoms in the first excited state and photons coming from the star will excite this and take to the higher energy state. And when you go lower in temperature, then the number of atoms in the first excited state keeps decreasing and you get weaker and weaker absorption lines of hydrogen. But as I said, this is what pointed out by Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin, who overcome you know, tremendous amount of gender discrimination to pursue a career and make a very fundamental contribution to astronomy and astrophysics. And in fact, uh, her work was later described by uh, Otto Struve, one of the one of the other sort of very well-known astrophysicists uh, earlier of the of our earlier generation, that her thesis was one perhaps one of the best thesis written uh, during her period of time. 
that uh, it does not mean that there is no hydrogen. It is just that you don't have hydrogen at the right energy levels to be able to see it prominently in the absorption spectrum, right? Okay. <clears throat> this particular graph actually illustrates the Balmer jump or Balmer limit, where the stellar continuum radiation, there is a sharp decline in intensity below the Balmer limit of 364.7 nanometers, okay? Where, which is caused by the ionization from the N equal to two level of hydrogen. This is the bound free opacity from N equal to two level. It, uh, it's ionized, so it's a free electron and you need the you know, short wavelengths to be able to do that. So short wavelengths means high frequencies, high energies, okay? Depends primarily on the number of hydrogen atoms, the bound free opacity in the N equal to two state. And you can see that it is more prominent in the A and B type stars, okay? In the O type stars, actually, because of the high temperature, it is going to be, there'll be hardly any electrons at that level. Most of it, a lot of it will be ionized or it will be at higher energy levels. So you also need electrons at the right level to give you the Balmer decrement. In very cool stars, you'll have hardly any electrons in the N equal to two state. Whereas in the very high uh, luminous stars, the O-type stars, they would all be in higher states or completely ionized. So this Balmer decrement is also has interesting and important astrophysical implications. On the face of it, one may assume that spectra reflect abundant differences, and that was what was done very early days, but we have seen that it is largely sensitive to surface temperature. And that is even more important than surface gravity or luminosity or abundance of species. Absorption occurs in the cooler outer layers of the photosphere and composition of the cooler outer layers is largely primitive. Primitive in the sense that when the stars formed, okay, from the material which the star formed, which largely consists of hydrogen and helium, and the metals which were formed and formed part of the interstellar medium and then the giant molecular clouds from which the stellar population originated. In any given star, nuclear reactions occur in the interiors of stars. So the composition in the interior is changing with time. So given from what we have done so far, I will just summarize what are the different spectral classes. The name, uh, name, um, the types which are named, they, they originated historically and have no specific uh, astronomical significance. Okay. Uh, so the O-type star are the hottest stars greater than 25,000 Kelvin. And ionized helium, helium plus is strong, helium and, and, and hydrogen is weak. Multiply ionized heavy elements you will see. And I've given an example over there. And helium actually gets weaker at lower temperatures because you don't have the energy to excite it. Okay. So you need the most uh, energetic photons to be able to excite helium. And, and, the, and the levels which you excite essentially depends on the photon energies. Photon energies depend on the temperature of the surface temperature of the star. B-type stars lower in temperature, still bluish in color, 11,000 to 20,000. Helium, less moderate, hydrogen also moderate, singly ionized heavy elements, Rigel is an example. As you keep going lower, A, blue-white, 7,500 to 11,000, helium gets weaker, and as we just saw, hydrogen gets stronger. You can also get singly ionized metals. Vega is an example. F-type, more whitish, Singly ionized and neutral metals, hydrogen moderate, but you can see that it was weaker than the A-type star, which is weaker. G-type, which is like our sun, 5,000 to 6,000, singly ionized, neutral metals, hydrogen is weak. So as I keep mentioning, the weak hydrogen doesn't mean hydrogen is not there. It's just that hydrogen has to be at the right level to be able to give you strong lines. K, Type, orangish, singly ionized metal, neutral metal, strong. Hydrogen is very faint, okay, if at all. 
And when you come to the M-type dwarfs, which are just about 2,500 to 3,500 degrees Kelvin, neutral atoms are strong and you can get strong molecular emission as you saw titanium oxide in the spectrum, which I showed you. Hydrogen is extremely faint, you know, barely visible at all. So these are the main spectral classes. These have been extended at the low end, but we will not deal with that right now. In addition to the seven broad categories that we talked about, the various mnemonics to remember this, earlier ones were very gender unfriendly and sexist, but there are more gender neutral ones in recent years. Canon also assigned subcategories zero to nine. Okay, 10 subgroups to denote the gradual transition from one spectral class to another. The differences are subtle and it requires trained eyes to see them. Uh, for, for our purposes, it is important to remember that in addition to the broad spectral classes denoted by the letters, there are also subclasses which are defined by the numbers and they define transitions from one class to another, subtle spectral differences. For example, an F type star, F5 star, would be halfway between an F0 and a G0. Our sun is a G2 star, and so is Alpha Centauri. Vega is A0, while Sirius is A1. Okay. So the Harvard key was essentially dependent on temperature. So the Harvard system was adopted as provisional IU standard in 1922, and it has remained as that. But whether IU grants it a different status is probably not very relevant now because it is almost a universally used system over here. So this is just an example of the seven broad categories. And as I've mentioned, uh, Canon assigns subcategories zero to nine to more precisely define subtle differences, okay? And at the highest, it is surface temperatures of 40,000 degrees Kelvin. And at the lower end, it is, over here in this plot is about 3000 degrees Kelvin. But as we saw today, that the least luminous star, which is claimed to be a star, is about 1500 degrees Kelvin or so. So it required a trained eye to see the subtle differences that you see uh, between the subclasses, but at least the Balmer lines you can see is weak in the O and then gets stronger in the A, keeps decreasing as you go to lower classes over here, okay? Uh, so the nice sort of uh, descriptions in this, uh, uh, in, these, uh, this, in this link over here, Michael Richmond has put these uh, as a creative comments for people to use and see. So this illustrates the same thing which I've mentioned over here in a graphical form rather than looking at individual spectra that when you have the highest temperatures, you can get ionized helium lines from that. Uh, um, when you come to slightly lower temperatures, you can excite lines of neutral helium. As you go lower, you have excited, hydrogen is in the first excited state and you get the Balmer lines. Then as you get lower in temperature, uh, you can see the hydrogen lines get weaker, or the helium line gets weaker by the time you come to F. Ionized helium you only see in the OB kind of stars, O to B. And then when you come to the lowest, you see the metals and K and M type stars, particularly M type stars, and even lower spectral classes of lower M type that you see molecular lines as well, all right? And this is just a schematic illustration to, uh, to sort of reinforce what I have said, that let's say hydrogen is in the N equal to two state over here, all right? N equal to two, two state over here. N equal to one is a ground state, and this is the first excited state. If you have a photon of 486 nanometers or so, n equal to, n will, can jump from n equal to two to n equal to four, okay? And that will give you the H9. Similarly, if you had four, the energy level appropriate for n equal to two to three, you will get the H alpha line. If an electron is at n equal to one, okay? Any photon, less than 10.2 electron volts, because that is the first level it can go to. The atom will remain unaffected. Right? 
So 2.55 electron volts, if n is equal to one, will remain unaffected, will remain the same. And as I qualitatively explained to you, that the strength of the lines and what you see would be governed by the Boltzmann's equation, which gives you the distribution of electrons at different energy levels and the Saha ionization equation, which gives you the level of ionization or degree of ionization or the amount of ionization of the species. For absorption, you need a combination of the presence of the species of atoms and ions and also at the appropriate energy level. So this is what the physical processes that I would like you to keep in mind. A more detailed mathematical treatment is beyond the purview of the present level of the course, but at least the physical processes, I hope, are clear to you. But you remember when you look at the hertzsprung russell diagram, even for the same spectral class, you may have luminous giants and supergiants. There could be an M-type supergiant, for example, an M-type giant. Okay. So in addition to the, the, the classification of spectra, classification starts made based on the spectra, which originated at the Harvard College Observatory, Harvard Observatory. The other classification is based on the luminosity. The Yerkes classification or the MKK, Morgan Keenan and Kelman in 1943 also was also known as the MK system. Surface, gravity, luminosity, gas pressure and densities could affect the line profiles as we saw. G equal to gravity, surface gravity, GM upon R squared would be low for giant stars compared with dwarfs. And we saw dwarfs, neutron stars have very high values of surface gravity. The Yerk system has six luminosity classes. 1A is the most luminous supergiants, then 1B is the less luminous. So as you go down, the luminous giants, normal giants, subgiants, and the main sequence stars, or dwarfs, main sequence, okay? Dwarfs, not in the sense of white dwarfs, but compared to the sequence of giant supergiants, they're dwarfs, okay? So sub-dwarfs and D are white dwarfs, are classes which were added later. So I've also given types of uh, examples of each type over here, from the most luminous supergiants to the main sequence stars, dwarfs, where Sun and Vega would fall in that category. So when you saw the spectral classification, it is G2, but in the classification of giants, it is V, so the class of the sun would be G2, phi, okay? Similarly, the first two A and two refer to the spectral class, one A refer to the giant class. Similarly for all the other stars or examples that I have listed over here. So this is a sort of brief introduction to the Harvard classification scheme and the Yerkes or the MK or the MKK classification scheme. When I mentioned about uh, M-type stars having a whole range of uh, luminosities, you hear absolute magnitude is plotted over here. You can see that you can have a range of absolute magnitude and the supergiants would be the most luminous ones, although the spectral class would be the same over here, all right? This is just to uh, pictorially illustrate what I've said earlier. As stars evolve, they follow specific trajectories in the HR diagram. But the MK system is used widely, but it has, an, it has no official sanction from the IEU. And Morgan, uh, one of the architects said in 79, the MK system has no authority, whatever. It has never been adopted as an official system by the IEU or by any astronomical organization. Its only authority lies in its usefulness. If it is not useful, it should be abundant. But it has been extremely useful in trying to differentiate um, objects of different luminosity with the same spectral class, okay, or similar spectral class.